Captain George McMurdy, a former Rough Rider and a fellow Harvard man and a Wall Street lawyer, wrote an order for Whittlesey's approval and then delivered it to the company commanders. Our mission is to hold this position at all costs. No falling back. Have this understood by every man in your command. It was of a piece with an order that General Alexander had issued on September 28th at the beginning of the campaign. Ground, once captured, must under no circumstances be given up in absence of direct, positive, and formal orders to do so emanating from these headquarters. Whittlesey had no such orders. He would hold his position, and he had 550 men. Whittlesey communicated with headquarters via carrier pigeon. General Alexander knew where Whittlesey was. He knew of his bad situation, at least as far as scraps of paper tied to a carrier pigeon's legs could describe them, but trusted that a Franco-American attack announced for the next day to hit the Germans at the 77th front from either side of the Argonne might bring relief. However, the attack failed, and a subsequent artillery barrage on October 4th, instead of scattering the Germans, landed on Whittlesey's own men. Whittlesey released his last pigeon, named Sha Ami, with the message, Our own artillery is dropping a barrage directly on us. For heaven's sake, stop it. The pigeon landed on a tree and had to be driven away by troopers climbing up and shaking the branch. Whether through the pigeon's courageous flight or the artillery schedule, the firing ceased. Ariel attempts to resupply the battalion, drop food, water, medicine, and ammunition to the enemy, and two planes and their crews were lost. Despite this, Whittlesey, McMurdy, and Captain Nelson Holderman, whose Company K had been the battalion's sole reinforcement, were exemplary in keeping the men steady. Whittlesey was intelligent and cool under fire. McMurdy was tough enough to ignore serious wounds and gregarious enough to roam the lines, offering words of encouragement despite an injured knee. Holderman, a California National Guardsman with experience along the Mexican border, was wounded, as almost everyone was, but maintained the command presence of a natural-born officer and fighter. The German attacks continued with mortars, flamethrowers, grenades, rifles, and machine guns, and there was still no relief, no food, no water, and no clean bandages for the troops. But on October 7th, units of the 82nd Division were sent on an attack to pry the German grip off of Whittlesey's trap battalion. The attack succeeded, the Germans fell back, and the survivors of the so-called Lost Battalion, as the press had dubbed them, emerged from their position in the Argonne, where they had been trapped for five days. There were only 194 of them who staggered out. Whittlesey was promoted to lieutenant colonel, and he and McMurdy and Holderman were awarded the Medal of Honor, as were four others. The Pigeon, wounded in action, won a Croix de Guerre, among other awards, and was later stuffed and put on exhibit in the Smithsonian, the most famous pigeon of the war. Whittlesey, celebrated as a war hero, went aboard a ship bound for Cuba in November 1921 and was lost at sea, a presumed suicide. McMurdy became a millionaire Wall Street lawyer. Holderman, regarded as a soldier soldier by his men, retired a colonel in the California National Guard and served as a commander in the Yountville Soldiers Home. On October 8th, the day Whittlesey's men were rescued, President Wilson responded to a note from Prince Maximilian von Baden, Germany's new chancellor, seeking an armistice on the grounds of Wilson's 14 points, which put forward a liberal program of open diplomacy, freedom of the seas, free trade, freedom for Belgium and France, and Alsace-Lorraine from German occupation, disarmament, borders drawn from the basis of nation-states rather than multinational empires, and the establishment of a League of Nations. Prince Max, as he was known, didn't agree with everything in the 14 points, but he offered to accept them as a basis for negotiation. A democratically inclined aristocrat, he eclipsed some of the powers of the Kaiser, brought social democrats into government, and removed generals Hindenburg and Ludendorff as the de facto leaders of Imperial Germany. Hindenburg and Ludendorff had towered over the civilian government, but they now conceded that the war was lost and Germany must seek terms. The goal was an orderly retreat to Germany's western borders in exchange for Britain, the United States, Italy, and France accepting Germany's territorial gains to the east. Wilson took four days to respond to Prince Max, and then it was through Secretary of State Robert Lansing. Lansing sought assurances that the prince did in fact speak for the German government and stated flatly that no negotiations could begin while the Germans occupied Belgium and France. Nothing came of the overture, and the war continued. West of the Argonne, the American 2nd 36 divisions, the former a collection of Marines and soldiers, the latter made up of soldiers from the Texas and Oklahoma National Guard, almost literally cowboys and Indians, 
took over a position from the French and on October 4th seized the Blancmont Ridge in fighting. The Americans then led the French in driving the Germans to the Ain River so that by October 27th, the French 4th Army could finally take its place alongside the American 1st Army. The 1st Army had continued to slog its way through the Meuse-Argonne, as Lawrence Stallings, a Marine veteran and below Wood, put it in his own history of the war, from now until its end, it was to be five weeks of unremitting pressure all along the front and for the doughboys in line of one damn machine gun after another. In front of them lay the still unbroken Kremhildstellung, reinforced by the Germans, which now had 40 divisions in the Meuse-Argonne. Organized both by terrain and by its grid of trenches into interlocking fields of defensive fire, the Kremhildstellung allowed the Germans to move from one strong point to another, which meant the Americans' only strategy could be tenaciously repeated assaults. It was now the French who were demanding that the Americans move more quickly. The Germans were falling back everywhere, while in the Meuse-Argonne, the Americans were clawing their way forward against stiff resistance. But they were making slow and steady progress. By mid-October, the Argonne forest had been cleared, which put the American main thrust between the River Air on the left, just east of the Argonne, and the River Meuse on the right. The chief objective was the area surrounding Romane, about five miles north from Montfaucon, bracketed by the Côte du Châtillon and the Côte du Marie on one side and the Cunel on the other. The Côte du Marie was considered the key to unlocking the Kremhildstellung. On October 14th, the Americans seized it in Romane, and they couldn't advance any further until they reduced the Côte du Châtillon with its newly rewired trenches, perhaps 200 machine guns. It had to be taken and in the undaunted assault, as General Douglas MacArthur remembered, officers fell and sergeants leaped to the command. Companies dwindled to platoons and corporals took over. At the end, Major Lloyd Ross, leading one of the attacking battalions, had only 300 men and six officers left out of 1,450 men and 25 officers. That is the way the Côte du Châtillon fell. The United States was now fielding two armies. The second army, with more than 175,000 men under General Robert Lee Bullard, was east of the Meuse River, covering the American right flank. The first army, more than a million strong, under the capable General Hunter Liggett, held the center. Having cracked the Hindenburg Line, Liggett paused to reorganize his exhausted troops, and then paused again, waiting for the French to catch up to him. Allied war planners had assumed that they could drive to victory in 1919. But now it seemed possible that if they were aggressive enough, they could pummel Germany into a far more rapid defeat. Pershing was optimistic, and General George C. Marshall reckoned that in 10 days, if the American advance could be maintained, about a million German soldiers in front and to the west of us would either have to surrender or disperse as individuals. The attack timetable that Pershing had originally drawn up at the beginning of the Musargon campaign took on new realism in this great charge of the First Army. Again, the Americans lined up three corps, left to right, the 1st Corps, the 5th Corps, and the 3rd Corps, with the 5th Corps taking the lead. The goal was to continue pressing harder, expanding each day's gains as the Germans lost their artillery and were forced into an ever more debilitating retreat. And that's what was happening. The attack began on November 1st. By November 5th, the Americans had cleared a broad swath of terror. <coughs> By November 5th, the Americans had cleared a huge swath of territory to the River Meuse, the Meuse-Argonne sector was finally theirs. But Pershing continued to press on, first making a move to capture Sedan and the French sector to the north, until French protests had him rescind the order, and then crossing the Meuse against German artillery bombardments. An armistice was arranged to take place at 11 a.m. on November 11th, but Pershing kept his men fighting to the end, and regretted that he hadn't been given a few more days to drive the American expeditionary force into Germany. Not for glory, but to put a formal mark on Germany's defeat. As it was, the 47-day Battle of the Meuse-Argonne marked the end of the First World War. America won the battle, and then on November 11th, you had an armistice. But what did the war actually achieve? And this gets back to the original question. Well, again, here's Harry Crocker's take on what it meant. And this is the optimistic take on American involvement in the First World War, if the deaths of soldiers really were worth it. What Crocker thinks is that the evils that followed World War I, everything that led to World War II and National Socialism, was no more inevitable than the good. And preventing the Second Reich's 
forced subjugation of the continent to the likes of Ludendorff was indeed a good thing. The First World War wasn't pointless. On the Western Front, France, Britain, and the United States successfully repelled an aggressor who had violated Belgian neutrality and planned to impose a not-so-very-gentle domination on the continent. The generals who achieved this didn't consider loss of life as meaningless and didn't callously ignore the suffering on the battlefield. Few believe that the Second World War was a senseless war or that it was fought by idiotic generals, although you can have plenty of criticisms against some generals, but far more lives were lost in the Second World War than in the First more than 60 million versus about 17 million. The First World War generals of the Western powers achieved their victory in four years. The Allied generals of the Second World War took six. And if the First World War witnessed the collapse of the monarchies of Central Europe and saw Bolsheviks seize power in Russia, at least the Western powers kept the Bolsheviks contained within Russia's borders. The Second World War ended with Eastern Europe in the hands of the Soviet communists. Hitler's former allies, and the West adversaries in the subsequent decades-long Cold War. In other words, the imperfect outcome of the First World War was in many ways no worse than the imperfect outcome of the Second, and both were better than if the Central Powers or the Fascist Powers had won. The Doughboys of the American Expeditionary Force helped win a great victory for the United States and, of course, for Britain and France. From his initial pacifism, the U.S. Marine Alvin York had convinced himself that the war was just— and many agreed with them that it was just in its scope and its consequences, and though the Americans wouldn't arrive in France until 1917, they played a very important, perhaps critical role in winning it. And some argue that it was the beginning of an arc of American history that took American soldiers from fighting on its frontiers to the Great War to World War II to fighting the Cold War as one of the world's superpowers in the atomic age. So there you go. That is an overview of American involvement in World War I and whether or not the contribution was worth it. So those are thoughts to consider on that topic. Okay, so that is all for today. That's today's episode. Thank you for joining me. As always, I want to thank the Knowlton's Rangers, especially our spy masters, Todd Warren, Jake Harrington, Beverly Ingle, Bill Ivey, Joyce Norman, Tyler from Colorado, Josh Reddick, Baron Fraza, Chris from Maine, Carl from Norway, Moondoggy from Ohio, Rick Knowlton, Vic and Irene, Mike from New York, Michelle, and Marlene. I'll explain what that is in a second. If you like the show and want to help it grow, there are four easy ways for you to do it. One, like and subscribe to the show on the podcast player of your choice. This helps spread the word about the show. Two, join our Facebook group. Here we can keep the discussion going about new episodes and you can talk about what you like and didn't like. And you can find this group if you just search for History Unplugged on Facebook. Three, we have an online store with t-shirts, phone covers, and other accessories featuring awesomely bad history puns that were crowdsourced by you, the audience. And you can find that if you go to tpublic, T-E-E, public.com and look for History Unplugged, or you just go to historyonthenet.com and look for our store there. Four, and this is really the best way to dive deep with History Unplugged, and that's to become one of the Knowlton's Rangers. If you know your American history, you know the Knowlton's Rangers were an elite spy and reconnaissance group in the American Revolutionary War, but it's also the name of the membership program of History Unplugged. You can join at three levels. If you join at the level of Scout, you can hear all the episodes of History Unplugged completely ad-free and get early access to new episodes, at least a week early. If you join at the Intelligence Officer level, you get special bonus episodes, like a 10-part series on the World War II hero Audie Murphy, a multi-part series called Ottoman Lives about different people in the Ottoman Empire, and a series called Rendezvous with Death that looks at biographical profiles of Americans who went to fight in World War I before America entered the war. The last level is Spy Master, where you get all that stuff, but you also get three hardcover history books, Forging a President, How the Wild West Created Teddy Roosevelt, Race to the Top of the World, Richard Byrd and the First Flight to the North Pole, and The Last Fighter Pilot, the true story of the final combat mission of World War II. Another bonus is you can choose a history topic for me to focus on for an entire episode that can go up to an hour, and I'll answer whatever question you have for me, and you get a shout out at the end of each episode. If you want to learn how to become a member of the Knowlton's Rangers, go to patreon.com slash unplugged. That's patreon.com slash unplugged. All right, well, that is all for my spiel. Thanks for listening to the History Unplugged podcast from ancient Greece to the Cold War and everything else in between. See you next time. (laughs) 